Welcome back art history students. Today we're going to talk about the art of the indigenous people of North America and then the Pacific Islands region or area of the world and do a little bit of um, comparison and contrasting between some of the other cultures that we've seen before. Let's get to it. First, we're going to talk about North America. We're not moving through this in chronological order. We're kind of moving from east to west a little bit and talking about various different resources and sort of the ways in which different people and their lifestyle changed and influenced their art. I wanted to start off with something that was kind of close to home. So this is Great Serpent Mound. This is in um, Ohio. It's not that far away from where we are right now. So this is an example of an earthwork. That's a uh, vocabulary word that you've heard before, specifically when we talked about the Nazca lines in uh, Peru down in South America. So it uses the surface of the earth as a material. Um, it's significantly a, it's not something that's created by a single artist. It's created by a group, by basically by an entire culture comes together to create um, these objects, both this one Great Serpent Mound and the Nazca lines that we talked about before. Next, we're going to move, like I said, a little bit west, and we're going to talk about the Plains Indians. Um, so these were migratory people. They have a, a nomadic lifestyle. They did not have as many permanent cultures and permanent settlements as some of the other tribes that we're going to see. So this is a robe with a battle scene on it. So let's talk about this a little bit more in depth. Okay. So the robe with battle scene um, commemorates a battle from 1797. So it is worn by a key player in the battle, basically by a veteran. And it serves uh, several purposes. So it's worn, so it's actually like a wearable object. It also is a status symbol within the community of sort of where this person has been um, veterans will oftentimes wear hats or those sorts of things so it's not an un it's not an unheard of practice and then it also aids in the storytelling tradition so we're going to break that down a little bit so we've kind of got a detail shot here of this robe with the battle scene and i want to make a clear distinction about um, this object as an oral storytelling aid and as a difference between iconography. So iconography is like a social understanding of who a character is by their clothing or by some sort of identifying marker, right? If, if there's an image in the Christian religion and it's a woman and she's wearing blue with a baby on her lap, it's very, very likely that it's Mary. This is a little bit different. This is an individual who was at this battle and they are the ones who kind of use this robe as a sort of memory marker to retell the story. So this is part of the oral storytelling tradition. So it's not necessarily, I just don't want you guys to be confused that say like this little guy's headdress or something would indicate him as a known individual to everyone. It would just be to the person who's making or telling the story. All right, on the note of storytelling, uh, this image is called Woha Between Two Worlds. And I absolutely love this image for a multitude of reasons. So we're going to break it down. Let's go back for a second. So Woha was imprisoned in Florida along with many others. So he was originally a Plains Indian and would have been then taken uh, to Florida. So this image, hold on, let's, all right, so let's break this down. So we see Woha here. It's very, very easy to sort of understand the story 
that Woha is trying to tell here. So he's talking this, or he's giving us this conflict that he's caught in the middle of. So on the one side over here, we have this uh, wild buffalo, and then over here we have this domesticated cow. So Woha is sort of standing in the middle, and on this side we see this sort of um, teepee that we're kind of familiar with from the Plains Indians, and then also this sort of um, European house. So Woha is literally caught between two worlds. Which world does he can he live in? Can he survive in? Right? So it's very, very symbolic and very much so personalized to this individual. I'm sure it's something that many people from the time frame were dealing with, this sort of which life style do we um, go along with. But it's not it's not like an iconographical image that everyone can understand we understand it through a symbolic understanding so we already have a little bit of knowledge of the story and that helps us in aiding it one other thing that i want to point out that's kind of interesting is this is from um, 1875 and the paper is eight and a half by 11. Uh, one of the things that i really do love about this image is it's so clearly denotes what Woha is trying to communicate and the struggle that he's going through, but it also sort of looks like something that maybe an eighth grader would draw. It's, it's very raw and um, original. So let's move on. All right, next we're sort of moving um, to the, past the plains, sort of to the mountainous area, the rocky, areas and then beyond. So this is a photograph of a Navajo medicine man in a healing ceremony. This image will be on the test, so pay attention. All right, so this image, the artwork here, is very, very important to the healing ceremony. So the healing ceremony is um, temporary it's overseen by a shaman or a medicine man and what happens is the shaman is using the art constructing it out of these uh, local materials like pollen and corn and other things like that to create this image and that image the art that he creates is what summons the ancestors or summons the spirits to that place in that moment so that they can assist in the healing of the sick person, right? So this is not artwork that exists forever. It is ephemeral, which means temporary. And it's also very important that, that the making of the artwork, the making of the image is what actually calls the spirits or the, the ancestors to this moment that will be on the test okay so a little bit sort of tracing off that idea of art being ephemeral or temporary one of the things that's very common in native american art and quite a bit of indigenous art in general is this objects are used for their utilitarian purpose and they oftentimes break down. So sometimes a lot of the art that indigenous people would have used in their everyday life is not left. And that's because it's used until it's basically unusable anymore and then disintegrates or deteriorates into nature. So there's this strong move to remember those traditional skills and those traditional crafts. This is Julia Parker. Julia Parker is a living and working artist today. Um, she has received the National Endowment for the Arts, I think in like 2007-ish. So this is a uh, contemporary picture of her. And she's a traditional basket weaver. So this is a skill set that's no longer practiced in a practical sense. It's only used really to remember and to keep alive those traditional skills. If you've ever been someone who wanted to maybe like do something yourself, like do it yourself, sometimes after you do a little bit of research, you come up with the conclusion that it might just be 
cheaper to purchase the object rather than make it yourself. So this is a very time consuming process. This is a very, um, like I said, not a skill that is in high demand, but it is a skill that's in demand so that we can remember it. So she actually takes on apprentices and stuff like that. So there's that same information. All right, another example of sort of remembering and reviving these traditional skills is Julia and Maria Martinez. Um, they are from the New Mexico area and in the 19, uh, 30s and 40s and 20s even, I guess, um, they revived this traditional pottery making processes from the people in the area, their sort of descendants. This is one of their most famous artworks. This is Bowl with the Plumbed Serpent. Let's talk about it a little bit more. So this motif that's on this traditional um, pottery vessel is a water guardian or like a, a, a serpent god of water. So this motif makes sense in the geographical area. New Mexico is mainly a desert. So these sorts of things, having water would be incredibly valuable. So it makes sense to put this water serpent or this water guardian on pottery, which was probably 100% used to store and hold water. All right, next we're moving to the Pacific North uh, West area. So um, this artwork is very, very easily recognizable. If you're familiar with Native American art at all, you'll probably know exactly what you're about to see. All right, so this is a dancing blanket, also known as ceremonial garb. So that word garb, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically just a word that means a set of grouping of things that go together to identify you. So if you're wearing, you know, your cleats and your helmet and all that kind of stuff, it makes it, that's your garb for being a ball player of whatever kind. So this is ceremonial garb. It goes together with a specific ceremony. So this is a dancing blanket. Um, this artwork is very, very, the Pacific, the Indian nations of the Pacific Northwest have this very identifiable style of these multitude of faces. It reminds me a lot of that Tao Te motif that we looked at at the beginning of the semester. So this sort of multitude of faces layered on top of each other. So we can see this like one major face in the middle, but then we also see these two eyes here and here and sort of like a nose mouth kind of thing that's resembled in this area. And we can you keep making more and more sort of faces out of these symmetrical eyes that we see. It's very, very uh, distinct. Here is another good example of that um, imagery. This is a, like a little bit of a newer art object, but it also coincides with that idea of traditional craft. So this object is not, um, not an artwork, you know, in that sort of like level, but yet it shows all of those traditional skills and also the traditional imagery associated with the Indians of the Pacific Northwest. All right, last but not least is this incredible um, eagle transformation mask, uh, which is used in a coming of age ceremony. So let's kind of break this down a little bit more. So, at a um, public or sort of group, tribe-wide coming of age ceremony. Coming of age is when you sort of go from a child into an adult. And this Eagle Transformation act, act mask actually physically opens and closes. And it gives that impression of transformation. Now, we have to remember that this wouldn't be done with like static, constant light like we're used to today. This would be do, done with like the flickering of firelight, probably more than likely in a nighttime ceremony. So that opening and closing would kind of, it, like imagine in a strobe light, if you've ever um, been in that environment, how 
that would imagine the transformation happening. And it makes sense. So there's this transformation happening between the eagle and the man, and then also this transformation from childhood into an adulthood. This image will probably also be on the test. All right. Next, we're going to move away from North America. We're still moving west, and we're going into the um, Pacific Islands. So this is kind of a general map of where we're going to be. All right. The first place we're going to go is Papua New Guinea. And there are a lot of really interesting things that the people in Papua New Guinea do, both from an art standpoint, like the art that they make and what they do with it. So one thing that I want to point out is one of the primary crops in this area are yams, which are basically sweet potatoes. Um, and they're gonna they're gonna make a big appearance. The yams are, the yams are big. All right. So this is the yam mask. Now. This mask is not meant to be worn by a person. It's meant to be worn by the yam, um, actually put on the yam in a harvest festival that uh, comes around once a year. So let's kind of break this object down. So um, it is meant, this mask is meant to look like the male reproductive organs that's not by accident that is by design and um, something very very interesting is that within this culture the grower of the largest yam actually achieves higher social status within within the community within the village which is so different from everything else that we've seen about how people achieve social status it's usually associated with birth with wealth with all these other kinds of achievements and this is just such a different um way in which you achieve higher social status so uh the yam masks are i think they're incredible give them a google it's worth it all right the next thing that we're going to talk about in papua new guinea is this abellum cult house so these are two images um I put this hot, this smaller image up here just to give you guys kind of a context of how big this building actually is. So it has this little tiny door down here and you actually have to crawl into it to get into the cult house. So what does this word mean? The cult house is basically like a re religious house, but it's, it's a, like a place to commune with the ancestors. So inside of the cult house, we see this representation of the ancestors, right? So there's kind of these masks. The motif on the exterior mimics these masks if you see them side by side. So this is a place for you to go as a community member to commune with your ancestors. And that's very, very important. So this ceremonial house has like a time span in which it exists. Right. So it's used for several rituals over a 20 to 30 year period, and then it's discarded. Right. It is left to disintegrate and a new cult house is built. Right. So this kind of makes sense. If you were a generation is approximately 30 years by the time that you reach sort of a a 30 to 35 ish year old period that's when you're becoming a decision maker within the community and you would be the person who needs to commune with the ancestors for guidance and the people that you would want to commune with aren't necessarily the ones from a thousand years ago or hundreds of years ago you would want to commune with your parents and grandparents and sort of the immediate generation that came before you, the ancestors that you actually know. And then by the time that, that that cycle sort of repeats and you become an ancestor to sort of your children or grandchildren. So I think this is very, very interesting. There's not this, there is no emphasis with this building placed on preserving the ancestors forever or anything like that. It is very much so a generational need, a small step to commune 
with the people who just came before you for advice and various other rituals. So there might be a question on the test, something like, is this building for all of the ancestors or some of the ancestors? So there might be some kind of true false question about that on the test. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about the art of Hawaii, and we're only actually going to look at one artwork, but it's going to lead us into um, our sort of next grouping that we're going to talk about. So you should probably be familiar with Hawaii. It is the 50th state in the United States. All right, so this is a cloak of red and yellow feathers. So this would have been worn um, by a high ranking individual or like sort of a high status symbol. These uh, red and yellow feathers come from very specific birds, which I think are kind of rare or maybe difficult to catch, something of that nature. So this is not necessarily something that you um, would wear every day, but oddly enough, it is actually worn into battle. So it is used as an armor in hand to hand combat and offers protection from the gods. Now, I have never been a soldier or been in a battle, but I'll tell you that I would want something a little bit more protective than a layer of feathers against me. But it sort of offers that protection from the gods. Those images that you see that as geometric patterns are sort of what summons or brings that power of the gods as part of the protection. So the geometric designs also identify the wearer as high ranking and also as specific. So each individual high ranking member who would have one of these would have their own geometric design that went along with them. So on the note of personalized geometric design to uh, identify you, the next place we're going to talk about is New Zealand. We're going to talk about this in great detail in sort of beginning in this video and then moving into the next video. So the indigenous people of New Zealand are called the Maori, and they have an elaborate tradition of tattooing. This is a drawing of a traditional Maori tattoo. So this tattoo would go over top of the whole face in most cases, sometimes um, depending on who the individual is, it's only certain areas. It denotes specific times in the life of the individual. So you would get your first tattoo maybe at puberty um, and at other significant life events would sort of be detailed on your face. So these tattoos come about at, like I said, very important moments in the life of the, the wearer or the person who's being tattooed, puberty, marriage, other significant life events. And what I really want you guys to remember as we go into the next uh, series, the next video or whatever, is that no two designs are alike. And these were used as like a legal form of signature. So just as no two lives are alike um, and no two sort of people's events within their lives are exactly the same, no two of these tattoos are the same. So this makes the Malray very, very interested in individualism, in who I am versus who you are. And that's going to come forward not only in the way in which they sort of um, abstractly design their faces and sort of telling their stories, it's also going to come apart in how they think about portraiture, which is what we're going to talk about next. So keep that significantly in mind that the Maori were very individualized. They believed very strongly about that. All right, these are your or these are your um, key terms for the this video. There's one more video. Um, good luck. Stay happy and healthy, guys.